All right, everybody, welcome back to Real Estate Today. I am one of your hosts, Jeff Beggins, along with my brother. Craig Beggins. Hello, hello. And our brother from another mother. Mike Puma. Dr. Mike Puma. So today, here's what we're going to talk about. We're, we're getting three, three really important topics. We're going to hit on them for about seven minutes or so. Keep this in, in and out around 20 minutes, 21 minutes. That's our goal. So today we're going to talk about pricing strategies in the shifting market. Um, we just went through the second topic is going to be talking about hurricanes and the impacts and what happens after the storms and you know, the far reaching effects of that. And number three, we're going to talk about consumer confidence and how it is affecting people's mindsets, decisions and shifts and decisions and where we think this is all going to go. So we're going to do action pack today. So let's open it up, guys. Let's start with pricing strategies in a shifting market. So just as a background for you guys, this is 31 years in business, 60,000 transactions done. We're one of the largest Century 21s in the world. We've got about 650 agents. We've got tons of offices. We've got agents virtually all over the place. So we're not just pontificating on this. This is true background, real stuff, real, real experience that we're bringing to you. So Craig, let's start with you. Yeah, let me just, I mean, yesterday I did a sales meeting actually in the office and in the Apollo Beach office. And I've got a relatively new agent who just picked up a listing. Um, and my, my topic here is what I call greed. These, this seller bought a house a year ago for $360,000 and they put it on the market for $650,000 with another agent. It sat on the market for 90 days because the agent took a 90 day listing and it didn't sell. Our agent came in and listed it for 570. And it's still not selling, and the seller's freaking out now. Now remember, they bought it a year ago for three ninety, right? How much appreciation have we had in the last year? Not a lot. I mean, it's still going up. Let's say you know typical appreciation is five percent a year. So what's five percent of three sixty? Eighteen thousand bucks. So the house should be like four hundred ish, but they want five seventy five. And every neighbor in town, all the agents are pricing based on what's available, but what's available isn't selling. So everybody's sitting there overpriced. And at some point, one seller is going to say, I have to sell and they're going to lower and they're going to get hit market value. And that's going to be the new market price. So now it's a race to the bottom, right? Because greed, no house that sold for 360 is worth 650 a year later. I'm sorry. I, I, it happened for a little while, but no, it's just not, it's not going to continue that way. And then the other thing we're teaching now is, you know, there's so much new construction in the marketplace. And if you're not educated, your pricing, if you see a, a new home by DR Horton, for example, that's sold for 489, that house was paying a bonus commission they paid closing costs and they bought down the interest rate. So the 489 was really like 469. But the seller sees a 489 sales price and thinks the house sold for 489, but it really didn't. It was it was supplemented with those other things. So it really takes a strong agent. And that's what we're doing with our agents now is we're doing really strong pricing consultations about what it takes. And the sellers have to listen if they want to sell. And the only people who are selling now are those that have to sell but they're falling into a trap and I think they need to pay attention and find a good agent, good in the market. Now let's hit the, th the topic that's really important in this one. It's the market, right? So yeah. there is no market as just a reminder, it's a complete micro market strategy we're talking about because we have different properties that are, they're selling in a day or two. We have other properties that sit in for a couple months, right? A couple, some properties sitting for several months. Right. Yep. So each market is different. So we, we got to make sure that we drill down on this because the strategies all goes back to two things. You can either have time or you can have money. You don't normally get both. You can't have both. So the if you're a seller watching, you need to really become what's important to you about getting to your new place. Is it the time in which you get there? Because that will require probably a lower price than you're thinking right now. Or if you think you want to wait it out and hope prices come back and demand comes back a little stronger, you might be here for a while. And that's okay. It all depends on your personal strategies on this one, because to you mentioned, Craig, there's, there's race to the bottom neighborhoods right now, where if you've got eight houses for sale in a neighborhood, that's not good because one of those people is hurting more than the other seven, right? 
and maybe it's a divorce court ordered divorce sale, get rid of this asset. You guys need to split it and you have 30 days to do it. So when things like that happen, you're going to see 25, 30, 40, 50, hundred thousand dollar cuts perhaps. And boom, there's the new cop for the neighborhood for the other seven are, are hit. And then now, now you have no problem. Now you have no choice, but to drop down because I just rebased the market. So your choice mm -hmm. is either I'm out of this market. I don't want to sell here. Let's let this kind of shit storm subside and then we'll come back later. But then now you run the gamble that what if interest rates keep you going up and demand softens even more. Now you're going to have 11 houses you're competing with and somebody else is going to have a hurt scenario. So, but that's only relevant in a market that has eight houses on the market or, or actually two or three realistically, right? When you have the buyers have options, that's where the problems come. Well, Mike, you're, you're putting a listing on the market today or this week. And you were telling us before we started this call that, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's only one other house for sale. That's bigger than 3,600 square feet. And how are you, how are you coaching that seller? So, yeah, I mean, for me, it's supply and demand, right? So that is typically where we start. And when I pulled all the most recent sales, those that actually sold and what price those sold at versus also what are they competing against? There really is only one other home right now that has a pool that's even remotely close in square footage in their particular area, right? In their zip code. So when we look at that, you would say automatically, okay, well, super low supply, we can kind of set this where we want to, right? That's what it would dictate. However, we are balancing that against there is demand in the marketplace, but the bulk of that demand is capped right now because of interest rates. So it's not that they won't be willing to pay a higher price. It's that they, a lot of them- They can't qualify can't because the rates are seven and a half percent. Exactly. So it's that balance, right? But at the end of the day, I don't pick the price. So I lay out the the numbers for them and say, listen, this is the this is the price point that's probably going to get you the fastest sale. This is the one that's going to, in my opinion, get us average days on market, which in this particular market is about 25 days. Um, or here's a, you know, you want to shoot for the stars, we can go higher and, and let it sit for a little bit and see right. what we get, right? Which one would you rather do? Now, we're also under contract to purchase a home. So because of timing, they want it to move average or faster. So we're picking a price that we believe will dictate that. Now, again, at the end of the day, the home is worth what someone's willing to pay. So if we go on the market in the first week and we get nobody, then we know that we're not priced properly, right? And we need to adjust that to, to until we find that sweet spot to get the demand. So that's kind of how I look well, at I, it. Well, I think for the Asians watching, I think, to look at it. you know, I'm helping my daughter right now price a house. And I mean, literally, I can go anywhere from 700 to 900 with this house based on the comps, right? This is a, a post firm, so the insurance is going to be less, blah, 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 blah. Anywhere from seven to 900, right? It doesn't have a pool. That's going to hurt it. Pool homes just sell better. Um, but it, it's all about seller's motivation. So my advice to the agents is, you know, of course, we want to maximize our seller's value, right? So let's, sh let's start high. But have the agreement with the seller educated that if it doesn't sell in 14 days, we're going to do a major price reduction, right? So in this case, we're talking like 785. It, we're thinking 750 is the number, but we might try 785 for 14 days. So what's 14 days is not long, right? If we get it because it's a nice house and there's not many for sale right now, right. great for us. If not, we hit the market. We could do a $35,000 price reduction, hit it down to 750, 750 and go. So don't be afraid to do that, right? That's right? But once again, if you're looking at, Jeff, you were saying if there's eight houses, there's one neighborhood that I'm, I'm intimate with here. There are 60 homes for sale. Now there's waterfront, there's off water, there's villas and there's townhouses and a whole bunch of different product mixes, but there's 60 homes for sale and they're all grossly overpriced and they're all sitting, nobody's buying them. Right. So that's happening. So the micro market part is huge. Mike, in your area and you're in West Jays, there's just not much. You're in an incredible school district there. If you have a one, a five bedroom home, you got a big family, you got two houses to choose from. That's a whole different scenario when there's 60 homes for sale and people. Are well, with the uh, shift in the topic too, with the hurricane coming through too, you're going to have buyers that are even more weary of moving to waterfront, right? So waterfront usually carries a premium value. What do you think now, Jeff? I mean, you live on the water. 
do you do you have buyers you think that are going to be nervous about what they just saw well, they have never yeah, experienced yeah short thing? answer is yes it's very interesting we just got um tropical or hurricane adalia just brushed 100 miles offshore right and it pretty much flooded the entire west coast of florida the barrier islands right the reality of it is we all live on sandbars that should never have been built on right they were designed to be breakwaters from mainland but you know greed got in and everyone decided to build some pretty things on it so we get wet every once in a while and then we get dry when the tide goes down so but the whole sandbars on, on the whole west coast of florida got wet so waterfront is is a huge ma macro market right so the differences are on a street in one street in one city there's multiple markets i've got the older homes that were built at ground level out of block is one market that's different than those that are built out of frame because water permeates through frame and it does not through blocks as easily right so you have two totally different types of homes that will flood or not flood you have homes that are elevated you have homes that are elevated and finished below and not finished below you have newer construction to different hurricane codes and you have different risk tolerances and budget requirements that that do that. I mean, I, I walk down my street. I've got homes that had three feet of water. I have homes that had nothing in them, right? All the same, like literally within a few hundred yards of each other. And that's every town up and down the bit. So what, what you're seeing is, yes, I've got a lot of neighbors that say, screw it, that's my last one. Uh, but everybody says that the first day. Right. And then they settle back in like, yeah, it's not so bad here. I'll, you know, it's a little island tax. Well, we're fine paying it. No big deal. It's uncomfortable for a day here and there. But look how beautiful the sunset is. Right. So that's what's happening now. People settling back in and it's great. But there are a couple of people that said, I'm out, I'm done. And I know of a couple of properties that will be coming on the market because of that. Now, I also know several people just on my one street that were not able to get back in their homes yet. So guess what? They had to go find a rental. They had to find another piece of property. That shift in use is different because now there's a flow inventory situation and now you have a lower inventory situation because there's homes that we had on the market we had to take off the market because they got wet and it's going to take months to probably get insurance claims done remediations done and to do that so that micro market just because became a little more complex right for ground level older homes that are affordable right but now affordability comes into play. Is it worth it? Because what's flood insurance going to do now when you have a home that's at a loss? So there's all kinds of equations that come into there. So it's micro market, micro market, micro market is the answer to that. But you, it's it's all so subjective. Do you are you a retiree? Are you in good health? Are you young? Are you mobile? Do you want to ride out storms? Do you not? Do you this? Do you that? Do you, is it worth it to you? Right. So that's kind of the the fun dynamic spectrum that I get to see. Now it's shifting a lot of interest into our new home projects because they're all way elevated. They're all solid concrete bunkers and with hurricane impact everything. So you literally could sit there and probably not even know a storm was going on. So that's a lot of renewed interest in those people say, I'm ready to get out of the ground floors and move up high and dry. So that has, you know, every, what every crisis there's opportunity, the old saying there. Yeah. Well, I think too, if you're for the agents watching, educate, right? Because I was in Chicago at an event when the hurricane hit here. And every person who found out I was from Florida was like, oh my God, are, is everything okay down there? Right? In their minds, they have no, no idea does not how help hurricanes that. work. So they just think the whole state of Florida is about to disappear, right? And the media scares the crap out of everyone. You know, they showed Bayshore from, I was in Chicago, I thought all of Bayshore area in Tampa completely flooded based on what they were showing. It turned out it was one lane one of one street, street was flooded. Entire area would have had <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, I mean, so they, but, but my point being is if we're not educating buyers and this is everywhere, right? It's funny as I was sitting at one round table, I had one person that lived their whole life in the Midwest and like, yeah, we have the same thing with tornadoes. And then somebody else was like, yeah, I'm from California. We dealt with earthquakes. Like every market, every state, every area has their thing that they have to be worried about, right? And they have to understand. But my <laughs> my knowledge of how earthquakes affect property values or, or what goes on, I have no idea. I've never, literally never experienced one. Same thing with tornadoes. Well, they've never experienced hurricanes. So if you're an agent in this market, educating them, understanding, especially now that that's happened, because you have buyers that were potentially looking to move into the marketplace that might be freaked out now because they have no idea what what actually happened. So educating them, 
letting them know we rebound, we're used to this. This is what how it affects the property values. There's a lot of different sub market, all those things. I would be high. And it's not just coast. And you've got flood, day. you've got river properties, Craig, way, way yep. inland that just crested a week after the storm. Right. So oh, yeah. it's far reaching. It's not just everyone thinks the coast, right? It's not. It goes all over the place. But to Mike, your point, it's got to be educate and teach them because there's major differences and the sub modalities in each micro market are huge. But that's why you as agents need to be niching in. You can't be selling in Tampa and think you're an expert and on a beach town because just a beach town is hard to be an expert in because there's so many intricacies on um, flows of canals and depths of canals and and um, exposures and wind and, and heights of streets and seawalls and everything that goes into it. And if you're a buyer, you need to have somebody who understands the intricacies of the niche that you're looking into. It's not just there's not one. It's not a commodity, guys. Real estate just not one. It's it's a highly specialized um, tool, and not enough people, in my opinion, treat it that way. Yeah, on that. which is I think where we need to dive into consumer confidence yeah. right now. Yes. So, you know, it's it's just we like to use the word crazy. It's a crazy market, but it's not. I want to replace those words with it. It's complex. It's complicated. It's confusing and it's competitive, right? We can't remember. We have to, we have to remember those things. This is a complex situation. And what I'm personally looking forward to is the thinning out of the crowd. You know, most, there's a, so many real estate agents right now. When you lose 1.2 million home sales a year and your agent population grows, you're going to let a starving agents. I showed a comparison at the sales meeting yesterday where, you know, agents that left us and went to another company that were doing 12 or 13 deals in the first six months of the year have done one or two this year. And then two of those agents have come back to us and they're crushing it. They're, they're you know, they're five or six deals versus two or one or two deals. And they said the difference is empower, educate, encourage. We're constantly pushing a message of teaching what's going on in the marketplace to empower, educate, and encourage the consumer to do what's right. Right. And it's, it's a tough balance right now. This market is challenging. So consumer confidence, the biggest challenge I was in a webinar yesterday. Um, the biggest challenge we're having now is aside from interest rates and people qualifying to get the loans is the, the debt. You know, you don't get 0% car loans anymore. You're paying seven or 8% for a car loan. You're, you're not getting 0% mortgages. You're, you're paying seven and a half percent for mortgages. Student loan debt is coming back. And all that stuff factors into your capability of borrowing money, right? So credit scores are going down. Qualifications are going up. We're going to be in a slow market, like a $4 million, $4 million home sale market for probably the next two or three years until something changes, except for the bump of the election that's going to come. The government might do something to make us happy for a little while. But we got to hunker down and, you know, just deal with it. as a real estate brokerage company, you know, our market share with a five million dollar home, a five million home sale market versus a four million home sale market. It's a big difference. You know, it's a 20 percent drop in sales. Well, I think it's interesting, though, too. I think we're we're all products of our environment. Right. So at that event, for example, we're at lunch one day and. The guy sitting next to me, we're talking, we were actually talking generally about consumer confidence and what was kind of going on. And he goes, oh man, I, you know, I just had three friends laid off. Right. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I just had three friends that I saw on LinkedIn got promoted. So in his mind, consumer confidence, probably a little scary. He knows three good friends that just got fired, right. Laid off of their jobs. I'm sitting there from my perspective saying, I just had three friends get raises. Right. So. My point being is that depending on what environment you're in, what's happening in your close circle, and we all have consumers, right, in our databases that are, go life is happening. And depending on what is happening in their particular world is going to be shape their view of what, of, of confidence, right? Are they confident or are they not confident? Are people getting jobs or are they losing jobs? What should I do? Is my home going up, my home going down? These are all things that are going through their head, but we are very much products of our environment. And so again, it's important that we're constantly educating ourselves beyond just our little bubble because there are things. Well, yeah. You got to pay attention to your source. Where are you getting your information from? You know, if I, I had friends calling me from California back to the hurricane thing for a minute, are you okay? Are you, Cause I live on the water. 
I mean, I'm, I'm really lucky that the water didn't, it came over my dock. It didn't go over, come over my seawall. So I'm like, why are you worried about me? Because the news made it look like the whole hurricane just decimated the entire state. So if you're watching what, whatever you're watching on social media or network or cable or whatever it is, tells the story that you're repeating. So your friends are getting promoted. The other guy's friends are getting laid off. What's the narrative? Right. Well, what I, do you choose? To look at? But I think it's both. I think we have to realize that consumer confidence is just the, from my perspective, do you, do you know you're going to be better off two years from now? Right. And the answer is no. Right. The answer flat out, let's be honest. Nobody knows. Is the Fed going to raise rates? They said they're going to keep raising rates until interest, until inflation comes into check. But is inflation going to come into check? I don't know. How does it when you keep printing, printing trillions of dollars? It's a, I don't know how it could. So, I mean, I'll give you a good example. Our hotel, right? And interest, the interest increase in our interest loan cost is $7 million additional. Um, that was profit. That is no longer profit to us. It goes to the bank. Right. So or it's going to be passed along to the consumer at a higher price. Or it's going to be or it's going to be shelved. Right. Right. And or then you're going to wait, which would be a shame because there's probably probably twenty five hundred people will be employed by this project. Right. From start to finish. And that that's that's where you have the impact. I know several projects that are being shelved right now for that one reason. Right. And then yeah. I've got friends that are worried about their job. Right. That they don't they don't they haven't been told they've lost their job. But you start reading headlines and other people lose their jobs. You're like, I don't know if I'm going to lose mine, right? Guy, let's be honest. We're looking at ways to trim costs as well because revenues right. are down and that's what everybody's doing. So everyone's a little bit nervous. So therefore, do I want to go buy something that I don't know where I'm going to be two years from now? The answer is not as much as I did a couple of years ago. So that's going, one of the reasons why you have the 4.4 million versus the five is everyone's going, shit, I don't know what's going to go on. So you have to, fewer people that can afford it, fewer people that are willing to spend it, right? And it costs more to buy it. So that combination is not good, right, for the grand market perspective. Now, there's always people, so Mike, to your point, that are making money, that are getting promoted, that, you know, they sold their business. There's always cash. There's always people on the highs. There's always people on the lows, right? Uh, but the point is not enough people feel they're going to be on the high and some think they may be on the low. So, therefore, their hands are in their pocket. Right? They're not reaching out to anything. They're not going to do, do credit lines. They're not going to buy an investment house because they read the articles that VRBO investment houses aren't going as strong as they would. And, you know, what's going on with tourism? What's going on with the economy, inflation? So I think we have to be honest about we've, we're in a position that we haven't been in for several, several years where people simply are making do with what they have because they don't need to take any risk and they won't, aren't willing to take any risk. So yeah, it's complex, it's confusing, and it's competitive. It, it's just, that's right. That's it. Now, alternatively, you could say it's crazy. So, it's just, so nah. here's what I do love is that the government always, in its infinite wisdom, acts way too fast and is way too and slow, right? So they acted way too fast in this in this response, in my opinion, right? I'm not an economist, but I'm a normal um, person um, with a little bit of ideas. Um, so what's going to happen is they're going to realize what everything we just said is true. And the economy is going to hit some terrible numbers, unemployment, and all those things are going to happen. And then they're going to be in the massive recession. They're coming into an election. And there's going to be no choice at some point but to create major stimulus. Now, that becomes maybe a, I don't know what it is, either give people money or slash rates to get people to spend money again. And it's going to come. And it's going to come not this quarter, probably not next quarter, probably not the quarter after that, maybe not next year. But soon enough, it's going to have to come back. And, and the longer they wait, the stronger the stimulus is going to have to be. Right. And it's just that's just it's supply and demand. It's, just, it's the cycles that we're in. So there will be a time in the not too distant future where things get spurred on again. But we're not there right now. We're not going to be there for a little while. And so I think everybody watching, buyer, seller, agent, anybody in the industry, general public, I think that we need to be really focused on our micro markets right now and decide whether you do want time or money. And if you're ready to make a move, make it, right? Make it. And even if you want to buy right now, you find a house you want, an investment that looks good for you, buy it, make it. Because the rates are just going to do nothing but go down from here, right? Maybe a couple little tweaks back up, but you know, it's the handwriting's on the wall. It's going to come back down. So 
go do it, make the move. You might have to pay a couple hundred bucks extra a month, which is a couple grand extra a year, but you're going to buy a beautiful house, get great prices on it and be able to refi out. Later. And you're going to get interest deductions and tax deductions and all the other stuff. I'm, Jeff, in my market right here, I'm on the what, south, south, south shore of Tampa Bay. Yep. Um, there are 1,600 apartment units under construction or just okay. recently completed. Oh, yeah. And they are a two bedroom, two bath is $2,000 a month. That's right. Right. And there is no benefit other than flexibility because next year your rent's going to go up. So even if you're paying a 7% mortgage rate fixed for 30 years, you know what your payment's going to be next month and you don't have to move or next year, but you don't have to move. There's this stability of owning a home. And if rates go down, great refinance, re refinance. But to be, oh my gosh, I can't believe 1,600 apartments. 1,600 apartments with two people per apartment, with two cars per apartment. That's 3,200 cars going back and forth to work every day. It's just changing everything. And rents are not going down. Rents are going up. So a 7% mortgage rate, if you actually go back to 1990, the average interest rate for a mortgage loan from 1990 till today, which is what, 30 years, was 7.5%. So we're right back to normal. We just got surprised. And, and we told y'all, this is generation, generationally low interest rates is what we were selling for the last four years. And we were right because you're probably never going to see those again. You'll see probably in the fives, but you're not going to see two and threes. For I hope sure. not. Yeah. No, that <laughs> screws, screws up a market. Yeah. I'm glad I got my fixed at three, but. So there you go. So we got lots and lots of topics for you today. We wanted to hit on the major three. Next week, we'll hit you up with some new ones. And we want to just keep this short to the point. And as always, give us a comment. Give us a like. Give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to this. And you're going to be getting pieces of real estate today every week. And a lot of other content we're pushing out to you guys. So thank you for your time watching Real Estate Today. And we'll see you guys next week.